So how did YouTube meet? There's two versions of the story. Okay. There is the truth. When you start out, it's all rosy. What do you do the first time that someone's like, you're dumb? I have this like Michael Jordan thing. It just motivates me. <laughs> yes. You know, Tim Ferriss has a very articulate post about, I don't want to be famous. At one point, I worked um, very closely with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Was there a moment when you go like, okay, I can do this. This is going to work. I have no fear whatsoever of being wrong in public. They're only boring because you you haven't asked them the right questions yet. I think The Rock is the type of person- If you're gonna regret after the 10 years being like, man, if I had bet on myself, like what could have happened? All right, let me let me get this right. Bang, bang. <laughs> Welcome to another exciting episode of The Good Times. I always wanted to say that. Um, and, um, He's um, been practicing. I've been practicing. And <laughs> I, I mean, now, oh, was, that a good, was that a good bang, bang? Did I get that right? It's very it was, solid. You, you nailed it. <laughs> I try. I know over your royalty check, but no. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us on what is a very, very special episode. We have two guests who need absolutely no introduction. Uh, the one and only uh, uh, Polina Marinova Pompiano, uh, founder of The Profile. Uh, you know, somebody you know I've followed for a long, long time uh, mm -hmm. for her work at Fortune and elsewhere, and now her amazing newsletter. And uh, the one and only Anthony Pomp. Pompiano, you know, he never sleeps, Crypto never sleeps, and, you know, uh, you know, we've all seen this stuff. Pomp needs no introduction. But, oh, my God, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. I, I uh, uh, am just happy to be here with you. It's perfect. How, how often do you both get to do stuff like this together where you're the guest and you both get to sit in? Not too often, actually. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Usually I'm invited and he's not, but this isn't nice Nice of you to include him. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I mean, we just wanted you, but, you know, I thought, he'll, you know, Pomp would be pissed off. He'll whine, he'll cry. He's so on I, his way in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We just edit his part out after this. But, okay, let's start with the really serious, gritty stuff up front, okay? Like, real hardball question. So, how did you two meet? What's the meet cute story? Give us the details. It's a great okay. question, Sri Ram. Uh, Sri Ram. <laughs> uh, okay. There's two versions of the story. The truth and And then there version. is the truth. No. <laughs> no. Remember, you know, be fact this check is, everything. This is already so exciting. Yeah. I can't wait. This uh, is awesome. No information on this show. Be fact check everything. <laughs> okay. High level version. We met on Twitter, ironically, when... I had way more Twitter followers than Anthony. I had like true. three, four thousand. He had like sixty-five. So I was like, you know, what's <laughs> another follow for this guy? And then he took it to mean like, huh, a reporter is interested in my work. So we, um, <laughs> I, I had written an article about this tech company, and then he had tweeted it, and I saw that, and so I liked the tweet. And I followed him. And then, because I saw he was an investor, whatever, early stage startups. And then he said, oh, do you want to go get coffee? And then he got coffee, except we just like talked about a lot of stuff. And then we've kept talking since then. Oh. You see how I, I did that? Wow. So, the best way to <laughs> translate that is if you have 65 followers and somebody follows and likes stuff and does all that at one time, you're under attack. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I hadn't had a notification in like three weeks. So I was like, oh, person must be trying to get my attention here. <laughs> the grand romantic gesture of the Twitter like, right? Like, you, you, know, you know, that person's interested in you. I was just interested in my article, but I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, I feel like I've known both of you, you know, uh, for a long time. And a lot of people may not know this, but Pomp and I have actually known each other for over a decade. And actually, at one time... Worked... I'm sorry, Pomp. So sad. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> uh, and actually, at one time, worked together uh, at Facebook ads way, way back in the uh, way, way back in the day. But Pomp, you know... Uh, it, you have such a fascinating story. And when I talk to people about you, I'm often reminded how many people actually don't know your story. So <laughs> you know, I, I want to kind of hear the first one because the part maybe even for Facebook, it's super fascinating is you served you know, in the armed forces and you actually written a lot, talked a lot about how it's impacted you. So talk to us a little bit about your story and background from there. And also for those of us who have not served, like what did, what, how did you change? What did that leave you with? Yeah. 
Uh, the short version is basically, uh, I played football in college, uh, was in the military, uh, deployed to Iraq in uh, 2008, 2009. Um, I came out of there, finished school, uh, and, uh, built and sold two very small, uh, software, uh, companies, um, went and worked at Facebook, uh, then, uh, spent a little bit of time working at uh, Snapchat and then started investing full time. Um, and pretty much I've been doing that now for, I don't know, eight years or so. Uh, I would say that there was two like major inflection points maybe in uh, uh, my career. One was the military. Uh, I went when I was 20 years old to Iraq. I had my 21st birthday in the desert and uh, I joke, but there's a, a sense of truth to it. It's like I showed up a little boy and I left, you know, a little bit uh, more experienced little boy and uh, came back to uh, kind of the real world. Um, and it was just a, it was a shock, right? Like you, you basically go from college looking to see when, uh, when's the next party or, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what person will, uh, what girl or whatever will talk to you hey, all hey. the time. <laughs> or, 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 or follow and like you or, on Twitter. Yes, There exactly. were no girls before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, you kind of go from, you know, that environment to, uh, all of a sudden I was deployed and most of the guys were kind of in the late twenties. Um, and they're worried about their mortgages, their wives, their kids. Uh, it's just a kind of crazy, you know, switching of circumstances. Uh, and then you add in, you know, kind of the violence and combat and, and kind of the war, uh, component to it. And, uh, you just grow up pretty quick. And so I think that was uh, one big thing, you know, maturity. Uh, I went to a number of, uh, different types of leadership schools in the military, uh, which probably were pretty helpful over time. Uh, but the biggest takeaway is just like, you're going to die sounds super morbid, but like all four of us will die. Everyone listening to this, you're going to die. Sorry, game over. Uh, and so then I think you just switch your mentality from this, like uh, uh, you get clarity around like what matters and what doesn't matter. Um, and you begin to enjoy things a lot more. So I, I think that was kind of a, a positive coming out of that scenario. Uh, and the second one was Facebook. Like, you know, I built two companies before that, but like companies may be a, a, a very loose, uh, kind way to describe it. Like basically I was, you know, searching in the dark, trying to figure out how the hell to do this. And when I went to Facebook, uh, you watched a front row seat of some of the top operators in the world. And, you know, Shreem, I always joked that uh, one of the ads meetings uh, every week, uh, you walked in and like, if you didn't know you were at Facebook, you'd be wondering where you were. Cause there's like people, you know, <laughs> sitting on top of filing cabinets and, you know, just like not exactly the corporate environment that most people think of, uh, but damn, did it work. Uh, and, you know, Sri Ram, obviously you were a huge piece of a lot of the ad revenue growth there, but, but, uh, there's many other people that worked with that were just amazing operators. And so I think just getting that crash course, right. It was like better than MBA, uh, in some ways. And, uh, uh those two experiences, I think were probably the big inflection points. Uh, but I just want to say, uh, Pomp, uh, I remember we used to have these weekly ad meeting at Facebook, and it was so clear that Pomp was one of the sharpest people uh, in the room. And we didn't really work super close together, but I remember being like, who's this guy? Because you always had the smartest things to say, and you just keep an eye out. And uh, so this is a very, very different era, but Pomp stored back then. What, what is this, like, keep an eye out? Are you, like, going to, like, take him in an alleyway? Like, what's... Well, what's well, you, you always had to spot talent. And it, that was a very, you know... That was a Facebook thing to do is uh, somebody, somebody in this room. It's like, literally like you're sitting there. You're like, people like, in this room are going to, no, it's like people in this room are definitely going to go create billion dollar companies. People in this room are definitely going to go be executives at, yeah. you know, future companies that aren't even created yet. And so you kind of, I don't, I don't know. Sure. sure you, you probably can articulate this better than I can, but like to some degree, you know, it's a special time yeah. because yeah. you realize like Facebook, probably while I was there went from maybe 35, 4,000 employees to like 12,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, just when you have that type of hyper growth and, you know, all the stuff that's happening, you just realize like, you know, a lot of companies don't get to go through this. I think in 2022, it may sound bizarre to people, but at 2012 to 2015 Facebook, everyone was an A-list player mm -hmm. and, you know, it was incredibly collaborative, but also competitive at times. Mm -hmm. And those meetings were some of the smartest people I'd ever worked with. So when somebody really stood out and Pomp really stood out, he knew his shit, you know, um, when he spoke, everyone paid attention. You're like, wait. Somebody standing out in this A-list people, you know, somebody to keep an eye on. But Pomp released really even 10 years ago. Yeah, I paid yeah. pay Sri Ram a lot of money I know, to say all I was these like, nice things. <laughs> <laughs> that cost you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paulina, I want to know your story too. Um, you know, Fortune, you, Sri Ram and I growing up when we moved to Silicon Valley, Fortune's the one magazine we'd like looked up to a lot, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, we'd see people attend these events. We'd see people showing up at the cover of it and we're like, oh my God, like so accomplished. It's 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 a really hard decision, I'd assume, to leave, you know, an institution like Fortune 
and to go out solo, do it yourself, go direct kind of thing. Uh, tell me your story leading through Fortune and then like after that as well. Yeah. Um, so I, my family uh, is from Bulgaria. I was born there. I went to first and second grade there. My parents won the green card lottery. Wow. Wow. So, we know what a big deal yeah, that I mean, is. Trust me, we, we, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I totally, I, can, I can't imagine how like, like a changing decade that long waiting process. We totally get it. Like all our friends went through this from India. It's just crazy. So it's, yeah. It's pretty it's insane. Real. My dad was determined to get out of Bulgaria. So he applied, I think the lotteries at the time were the US, Canada and Australia. He applied to all of them. <laughs> so, uh, and he, he submitted applications for both him and my mom. So the surface area of winning was a little bit, you know, in his favor. So mm -hmm. my mom ended up winning and uh, that was in 1999. And then in 2000, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia the only reason being we knew people here. So after you win the lottery, you have to go to the embassy and prove that like you're not going to be homeless or jobless. So we found some random distant family friend who was happy to sponsor us. Yeah. So we ended up in Atlanta. And when, so we came here, I was eight turning nine. Uh, and then I spent I mean, growing up in Atlanta, I went to the University of Georgia. I majored in journalism there. I worked at my high school newspaper. And then at Georgia, I became editor-in-chief of the school paper. And from there, I was like, I mean, I'm set for life. I had internships at USA Today, CNN. I was like, who wouldn't want to hire me? Yeah. And then the answer was nobody wanted to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still remember I got a job offer from this newspaper in rural Georgia in the salary. This is annual salary. While you were at Facebook, I was getting offered $18,000 a year. Oh my God. And so that, <laughs> that's like, isn't mind. that below minimum wage? That, that was, I don't, I don't even like, I, I was offended, but I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, Somebody's it is a willing job. to pay me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess the cost of living wasn't that expensive there. But yeah, I just I knew my whole life. I was just like I had the mentality of I don't want to be a big fish in a small pond. I'd way rather be a small fish in a big pond. So I wanted to move to um, New York. That was my dream. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, while nobody was hiring me, I needed money. So I did the thing where I graduated college and I moved back home. I lived on my mom's couch and I before remote work was a thing, I worked remotely for USA Today and I worked physically at CNN because the CNN headquarters is in Atlanta. So I would drive, I would go to CNN in the morning from like seven to four or something and then drive home and work remotely for USA Today from six to 11 p.m. And wow. I just like was saving all the cash. So I paid off all my student debt and I was like, I'm ready. I can, I can move to New York now and make $20,000 a year. No. Um, <laughs> so then after a year, I got a job at a startup in New York, moved there. And then from there made it to fortune. And I got to fortune, not as, not in a reporting role, but in a audience engagement role, which was like social media mm -hmm. account person yeah. at the time. And so, yeah, from there, I just, uh, I weaseled my way into writing tech the newsletter term sheet. And then that was my dream job. And then I left to start my own newsletter. Yeah. Uh, um, wow. you, your story is so fascinating. By the way, first of all, you folks are the first couple we've had on, on, you know, the sort of the YouTube version of the show. It's kind of, it began kind of starting off with like probably the most powerful couple in technology. That's and, you know, that's yeah. Oh my God. I, Alexis I wanna... and Serena, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you folks are like, you know, the, the number one power couple out here, but, you know, I was thinking about this when I was preparing for this. There's actually one interesting common thread between both your stories, which is in an alternative timeline, there's a version of Pomp who is a VP at Facebook or a fan company who kind of has that career. And Pomp, trust me, folks, is more than capable of killing it in like a product engineering type role. And you, you know, you kind of made it into the belly of the beast. You know, you are at you know, a premier institution and, you know, there's kind of a ladder there, you know, you become editor, you kind of like climb the journalism career ladder. And so, Paulina, maybe starting with you, like, what made you maybe go, you know, like, and others have done this, like, you know, Barry Weiss and some others have done this, but we go, okay, I'm going to leave go the, ahead. you know, leave yeah. the logo, the fortune, the brand, and I'm going to, you know, kind of but trust myself and my audience willing to make that plunge. Like, what made you do that? Because both of you made that plunge in different ways. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, when I left, because I started thinking about this in January of 2020, I didn't have 
I don't think reporters had left to do independent subsacks at the time. At least I didn't know any when I was making the decision. Um, so the only person I knew and talked to was the browser uh, and Robert. And I talked to him and then I was like, I think I can do this. And you know, like when you hear something once and then you start seeing it everywhere, I started seeing like the rise of the passion economy and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately I thought at Fortune, I write about entrepreneurship but I've never started a business. Like I kind of felt like a hypocrite a little bit in terms of I'm writing and critiquing and analyzing these people's companies. Whereas I myself have never undergone that. And Anthony and I obviously had a lot of discussions about leaving. And I like to think that in our relationship, like I'm kind of the brakes and he's more of the gas. So <laughs> I'm very, very risk averse. Mm -hmm. So I backed my way into how many paying members of the profile do I need to match my salary at, uh, I was going to say Facebook, not Facebook, at Fortune, because to me that was success. And so we backed our way into that number and then I thought it was realistic. So I left in March of 2020. And do you remember what moment made you go? Because by the way, folks, you know, we're going to leave all the links here, but if you haven't already subscribed to the profile, go read it. There's some amazing stuff in there. You know, not everyone gets a rock to engage with you. We'll get to the rock <laughs> later. But, you know, was there a moment when, it must have been scary, right? Um, and yes. you kind of, and uh, was there a moment when you go like, okay, I can do this. This is going to work. You know, something's taken. Or was there like a catalytic moment? Yeah, there was one moment I was on the subway <laughs> in New York and I just like kept thinking about it. And I called it the seesaw of misery. Like I would wake up and I'd be like, absolutely, I'm going to leave my job. And yeah. then before I went to bed, I was like, are you crazy? Like you worked so hard to get here. Why would you ever leave now? And um, I think I had a few like, so the question that pushed me over the edge was, I've been at Fortune for five years. If I stay another five, will I have learned more or less then if I leave, do the profile, fail miserably, or in five years, will I have learned more from this experience instead? And the answer was the latter. So that's what kind of push. I'm, I'm curious, do you remember this time? I remember. <laughs> I remember very well. I mean, uh, yeah. The only thing I would add, I think, is uh, Plinna is very risk averse, but like in a in, like an intelligent underwriter of risk way. So there's some right. people just like, I don't want to take any risk at all. So like, I'm going to sit inside like, you know, bubble boy, right? And like not go right. outside because like it may rain today. Uh, but Plinna is much more, I think, like calculated risk. Yeah. And uh, a huge piece of the conversation, uh, there's two pieces. One was like, just like the math, right? Like it, it when you're like, hey, I'm going to quit my job. That sounds like that sounds insane. But then if you're like, oh, I'm going to quit my job and I have to get, you know, X number of subscribers, whatever the number was. Uh, okay, well, like how many do I have now? How much would I have to get each month for the re remainder of the year to like get there? But, oh, could I do that? Like, yeah, that's slower growth than I already have right now. It's so, like, I'm probably going to get there anyways. What if I leave and focus on a full time rather than just do it like a weekend thing? Right. So I think there was like a lot of uh, just right. like, what is the math here? And like, how do you make yeah. that work? Uh, but the other thing too, uh, which is probably a common theme in, in our relationship, and, and uh, I, I like to think that we've uh, kind of helped other people in our lives uh, learn over time, it's just like betting on yourself, mm -hmm. right? And, and it sounds so cliche and so stupid and all stuff, but um, it, it goes to Plinna saying like, uh, you could work somewhere for 10 years and, uh, you know, it's a great life. It, it, it uh, is perfect for a lot of people. But if you're going to regret after the 10 years being like, man, if I had bet on myself, like what could have happened? Like you better go bet on yourself. And the thing um, that I do think is true for many people in the tech industry specifically, uh, and, and I sure when I saw it on Facebook a, a million times, people would leave, go work somewhere, and like two weeks later they'd come back and be like, "Hey, I'm back." Yep. <laughs> be like, hey, we just had like a big party for you like two weeks ago. Like you're leaving after you know like seven years. You no, know, right? now there's even a phrase for it. It's, it's called the boomerang. The boomerang, yeah. the boomerang right? <laughs> so like yeah, so like the boomerang definitely is more likely to happen in like tech, in journalism, like all these things where mm -hmm. uh, they're glad to have you back. So in some way, it's almost like you know you can do it and, and try it out, and if you don't like it, you can come back in like two months. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think probably the scariest part that Plina uh, is downplaying a little bit is that she made the decision before <laughs> like the pandemic stuff like really hit. Yeah. And so she put in her notice, you know, two, three weeks, whatever it was. And her last day last week was the day oh, yeah. that they announced all the lockdowns in, oh in New York. Wow. 
So like you're basically like walking out the door. There is no, you know, big party or anything because you're sitting yeah. at home already. And yeah. then they're like, oh, by the way, we're shutting down the entire city. And you're like, oh, my God, like what is about yeah. to happen? Right. And, and this is a really good lesson that I learned is that you can plan and prepare for the worst. I think I made like what well, Anthony made me do this because I kept going back and forth. He was like, make a pro and con list. Like, what are you afraid of? Basically, why won't you quit? Mm -hmm. and on the con list, my biggest fear was like, I read about this stuff all the time. It's a 10 year cycle. There's going to be a recession. Why would I leave right before a recession? But then you realize like, even if you work a nice, safe, comfortable job, there is no guarantee that you're yeah. not going to get laid off. Yep. Um, so anyway, so I was like, oh my God, a recession, what if that happens? And then, and then COVID happened. I was like, oh my God, I didn't, I, that was not on my list. So there's yeah. so many things that you just cannot prepare. And I think, uh, what an amazing story, right? I think for me, you know, Pomp, you mentioned this one theme that you both seem to have is just betting on yourself. The other thing that I've seen just from you, Polina, you just mentioned this and Pomp, I see this literally on your Twitter profile too, is just learning, optimizing for mm -hmm. learning. And, uh, there's just something about just pursuing knowledge, which I think is like really admirable. And uh, it comes at, you know, it's very easy to be like, well, I quit my job. I just like jumped into this thing and, uh, you know, adventure, let's like find out what's happening. But it's it's incredibly yeah. risky. It's incredibly ambitious to think about it as like, yeah, I can go do this. But also from a perspective of learning, you know, yeah. that's, I think that's like, it's really admirable. I think to it's do kind that. of, you know, I mean, Pomp, you and I have known each other a lot longer. Um, and, you know, I think this kind of undercuts all of Pomp's work. And maybe, you know, okay, this is a question I want to ask you. I asked you this in private, but it's kind of fun to ask you this over here. Uh, oh, you know, shit. I'm, uh, <laughs> you didn't remember what you said on private. <laughs> uh, oh, well, uh, uh, well, we'll see. We'll get, we'll You're almost hold me on this. Don't worry. <laughs> no, but I, I would say Pomp is a super generous person. He's the person I usually ask about a few years ago when I left Twitter. I was like, hey, how do I do this content thing? And then I call up every once in a while for advice in always so generous but maybe look i mean if somebody you know went to sleep like six years ago and woke up today you're like okay here you are you know facebook product manager you know if i had to project out then you'd have been like you know in some tech role or maybe in, you know full-fledged venture capital you know but here you are with millions of followers on twitter on youtube doing a popular podcast so deconstruct maybe your journey and your system for how to do so, because it is quite remarkable. And I think a lot of people want to follow in your footsteps. Yeah. Uh, there was no master plan, obviously. Um, actually, uh, one of the unique things was um, while I was at Facebook, I had uh, helped a number of different brands uh, kind of uh, Facebook's like a weird place where like you have your job and then like you do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you know, Google has 20% time or whatever, but uh, Facebook's not as structured. And because I was uh, the product manager for the Facebook pages growth team, a lot of times what would happen is somebody would be like the brand manager or like the point of contact for, um, I remember uh, there's an Instagram account, fuck Jerry, right? Which is oh, yeah. kind of a meme account. And yeah. somehow I got introduced to that team and they were like, they're trying to figure out what to do on Facebook. Like they're big on Instagram, but like, how do they figure out Facebook? And so this kept happening. Uh, and so it made me think about like, hey, how do you build an audience using Facebook pages? And I understood the system and all stuff. Uh, at one point, I worked um, very closely with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Sheryl Sandberg uh, to help them do something very similar for their own personal pages without them actually changing uh, the algorithm or changing the product. They wanted to figure out, hey, how do we create content? And, and you know, frankly, uh, they probably don't get the credit, but they were very early to the go direct uh, uh, kind of yeah. movement. And we're talking, you know, t at the end of 2014, they're talking about how do we talk directly to our users uh, yeah. without having to go through other channels. So pr pretty forward thinking on their part. Um, but by the time it got to like the beginning of 2017, I was like, I've helped all these other people do this. And like, I've never done it for myself. Yeah. And so that was really the start was like, oh, like I should try one platform. And uh, frankly, I didn't think I had enough uh, knowledge of what I wanted to do to like do video or audio or any of this other stuff. So I started on Twitter, it was just text-based. And uh, Polina is joking, but also serious. Like she literally had more Twitter followers than me. And so I'm just like a very- So that pissed them off. <laughs> very competitive <laughs> person. Uh, not, not to compete with her, but just like there's a number. And this speaks to, I think, the positives and negatives of social media. But it was like, okay, how do I move that number, right? And literally I ran a growth team at Facebook. Like that's what we did all day long was we just laid awake at night. Like how do we move this number? Mm -hmm. And so obviously you you very quickly figure out all the different things that you can do to, to do that. Um, and- now we're into like uh, May of 2018. So it's like been a year and a half of just Twitter. Uh, and this is right about the time that there was, it was starting to become obvious that deplatforming was going to be a thing, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so there'd already been a couple of people who'd been removed and it was like very obvious, like, oh, those are the extreme people, you know, by most people's standards, but like what stops them from just breaking the extreme, you know, kind of uh, boundary in closer, closer, closer. And like, eventually like we're all deplatformed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were on a flight and Plano was like, well, if you're worried about that stuff, like, why don't you just like create an email? And I was like, ah, like that sounds crazy. You know, that's your thing. Like, I, I'm not really good at that, whatever. And she eventually convinced me and I'm the type of person where she like, we're literally on the plane. She's like, like, just do it. And I like went and I signed up for Substack. I think I was like one of the first, I don't know, 20, 40, 50 people, whatever on there. And I was just like, I have to write an email and send it tomorrow or like, I will not do this. Right. And so I started and then just every single day, just do it over, over and over, over again. And so it was like Twitter, uh, the email, then I did um, the podcast and then eventually YouTube. And I would say that the two lessons I learned over time was like, one, I had to do it every day. If I didn't do it every day, I would eventually just like give up on it. And so there was like, you know, I, I joke a lot about like the relentless aspect of it, but like that's mm -hmm. literally what it was is just like get up, do it, move on. And those little actions lead to kind of bigger uh, progress. Um, and then the other thing was uh, I have no fear whatsoever of being wrong in public which like pisses some people off on the internet because they're like, this guy's wrong. And I'm like, yeah, so are you. I just am willing to like admit it publicly, right? Like I'm, I'm wrong every day. Uh, but like, hopefully I'm just like right 51% of the time and wrong 49%, like I'll be okay. Um, and so what that allows me to do today and, and allowed me to do over time was just like go pursue the things that I was intellectually like curious about. And I think when you approach it from a, hey, I'm trying to learn, uh, people are just like, yeah, I'm trying to do that too. Like you don't approach it kind of from the institutional, I have all the answers, there's certainty, like, you know, whatever. And I would say the things that in hindsight over, you know, five, six years, you create a bunch of content, put it on the internet. Like you eventually look back, you're like, ah, that thing, like, you know, if I could go back, I would do it differently. Or I would have said something right. different or, you know, it was live and I said, whatever. Uh, it's always around like certainty, right? It's always around whatever. And I think that that's like a, a big balance now is mm -hmm. that like, how do you keep the intellectual curiosity and you almost have to like slay your own ego to some degree uh -huh. because the bigger the audience becomes, they're looking at you like, oh, you know what you're talking about. But I think actually the people I admire the most on the internet are the people mm -hmm. who have huge audiences and they're like, no, like I'm an idiot. Like, I, like I'm a complete moron. And then I think that that intellectual humility ends up actually letting them keep asking dumb questions, keep the okay. curiosity going. And, you know, as we know, in hindsight, like that's what leads to the audience growth. Okay. I think, by the way, I want to say, Pomp's saying here today what exact same thing I remember a few years ago when I called you and asked you for advice on how to do content. You said, a lot of people ask me this, and they never do what, I, what I'm just going to tell you, which She's is you got to do it every day, yeah. right? Pick something. <laughs> you can write a tweet. You can write an email, right? Smoke signal, whatever it is, but you've got to do it every day. Um, and you also said, like, most people ask me this, get this answer, and then don't follow through. Yep. So I don't know whether I've done it every day, but I, I still remember that whole, the grind. I think at some point you asked me to talk to Pomp too, and uh, I got on a call with you, and I was like, you know, I have, like, this is a like, pretty good time show, or just when we were starting. And you were like, you said the same thing. You were like, you just have to go do it. Like, that's <laughs> literally the only advice I can give you. And it might really suck in the beginning, but you're just going to have to, like, build muscle and just like start doing the shows and most people will hang up this phone call and then be like yeah that was great advice and never follow yeah. through so don't be one of yeah. them and i was like thanks yeah. so, <laughs> great. so let's get into this because i try and study you and you know you don't have hundreds of episodes of your podcast so what makes for a good conversation and who are good guests and terrible guests and i prefer names on either <laughs> all right so uh, I'm going to answer the podcast in a second, but let's answer the good conversation first. Plinna and I actually talk about this quite often. And uh, um, if you think of good conversation, that could be dinner. That could be somebody you meet randomly on the street. That could be a podcast. Like, like there's so many different ways. Uh, what is the one thing that you think makes the best conversation? And I'm wondering if she's going to say the, th the thing that I believe she's going to say. Well, so there's two. Can I say okay. two? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> people who get d cut out the small talk and get to the meat of it. Yeah. No chit chat. No chit chat. <laughs> and um, people who ask a lot of questions. I yeah. think we've been to dinners where, I mean, we went to one dinner with one couple that I will not name. <laughs> and I was really looking forward to the conversation because they were both very interesting people on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then you sit down and it's like, I don't even think they knew my name. Like we were just peppering them with questions, but there was no, it was just a monologue. They were not curious at all. Yeah. So 
Uh, I thought yeah, you were going to say... Go grab dinner with these two. I was just going to no, say... we can't tell people. If we tell yeah. people this in public, then they're not they're not going to answer all of our questions. No, I want. No, I want. The, the, uh, the, the thing that I, I thought she was going to say, which is tangentially related, is uh, the quality of the conversation a lot of times is dictated by the quality of the questions. Yeah. yeah. And that go, and that works in both directions, right? Yeah. So like it it, go, it feeds back into kind of the no chit chat uh, thing as well. We, we we like the word chit chat because uh we have a couple uh friend that uh, uh You should say who it is. Uh, I don't want I don't want to put him on blast, but <laughs> he he is known as Mr. No Chit Chat. He he uh one time spoke one word to a uh, grocery store cashier and it was like a, a momentous occasion because <laughs> he's just direct to the point all the time. But I I think what happens is like if you ask good questions and you're talking to someone that's halfway interesting, then it should be an interesting conversation. But Plano one time said yeah, to me, wait, can I tell them? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I love this question. No, this is great. Um, yeah. In, in college, uh, I majored in journalism and we had this like intro to journalism class. Uh, and the assignment was to profile someone. So I was like, Oh, amazing. Right. So you pick a random person and you write a profile on them. And I, I, I feel like I, I don't remember who it was, but it was like a fellow student that I picked. Mm -hmm. And then I asked them questions, but they were the person I thought gave me just super superficial, boring answers. So I went back to my professor and I said, I got to pick somebody else. Like this is probably the most boring person I've ever come into contact with. And some, somehow I picked them. Um, and so my professor realized that like, I hadn't done my job as an interviewer, so he didn't let me switch. He said, they're only boring because you haven't asked them the right questions yet. So that kind of always stuck with me in conversation and writing. It's not up to the person to entertain you and make the story interesting. It's up to you to ask the right questions to like tease it out of them. Both of you, you know, kind of professional question askers in a way, um, you know, when you go into a college, especially, you know, something like this, we're kind of having fun, but let's say a podcast you know, I've, you know, if you study like the greats, like Howard Stern, Larry King, you see this multitude of techniques. Some people are incredibly prepared um, and they are like, okay, I'm going to ask you these things and they go deep in research. Like Lex Friedman is a good example, very prepared, very structured in how he goes about it. And then there are others who are like, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to almost know nothing and go with the flow. Larry King was famous for not doing research and he was like, I'm just going to go in, go with the flow and see where it takes me. And a lot of people fall on the spectrum. So when you go into a conversation, especially one on air, how much are you preparing? How much are you going with the flow? How much are you thinking, wait, I need to get this person to go here because I need to ask this. How, how are you managing the conversation? Go ahead. You go first because you're way more prepared yeah. than me. We have very different <laughs> approaches. But to me, my most successful, so I over prepare. I read everything that's been written on this person. If they have a book, I try to read the book. If they've done podcasts, I listen to podcasts, et cetera. But then that helps me realize like the questions that they get asked the most. I don't want to ask those questions. So I try yeah, to ask yeah. something a little bit different. And then during the conversation though, I listen, like I actively try to listen to everything because the best interviews are when somebody makes an offhand comment and you catch that. And then you ask a follow-up on that, mm -hmm. that, you know, out of nowhere. Um, so for me, I, I mean, I've gotten scoops that way. I've gotten a lot of things that way just by listening and not being like, uh, clinical about question one, question two, question three. It's amazing you say that because to me, that is the magic where you kind of capture that moment of them saying something that's like not part of their script. Exactly. And, uh, and then you're like, oh, wait, why? Mm -hmm. And then you start like pulling that thread. And that I think leads to much more interesting conversations than the usual the script that they expect or you're expected to ask and all of that like that stuff is just this like kabuki dance mm -hmm. that you it's kind of like have to get out of the way and then the fun part happens in those like little moments that come in between exactly and it's something that's very very hard especially if you work at a place like fortune or forbes where you're interviewing super media trained ceos all the right. time you right. need more than 30 minutes to yeah. get that out it's also i think like you know in an interview for journalism where you're trying to maybe get you know, a scoop of information. That's different. I think in a podcast, you know, and Pam, mm. I'm curious how you think about this, which is sometimes there are guests who are just on their talking points and are structured, you know, and how do you shake them off this? How do you kind of attack, you know, maybe tricky guests? Yeah. Feel free to use names. So <laughs> uh, here's what I would say is um, 
I, I've gone back and forth. Like I didn't have uh, experience doing it when I started in 2018, right? I just literally was like, oh, this is a microphone. Like, let's just have a conversation. Um, and so in the beginning, I, I prepared a lot because I frankly, I just, I didn't want to sound stupid to them, right? Because I was like, oh, I don't know nothing about this. Like, let me at least have like a little base knowledge. Uh, and that got really boring very quickly because I basically knew what the conversation was going to be before I had it. And so I was like, this sucks. Like, this is, I felt like I was wasting my time, even though the audience liked the episodes. So then I stopped doing any preparation, like over rotate on the other side. Uh, and then I would finish. And then like afterwards, I'd be talking to them like, damn, I wish I had known that I would have asked you about it or, or whatever. So I, I've kind of found like a happy medium of uh, I obviously know who the person is. I know maybe like three or four bullet points about their background. Uh, and then I'll have uh, some bullet points like on topics, but I may not even know what their position is on it. Right. And I don't actually don't look at it as an interview which I think like obviously journalism is, is very different and, and some people will treat their podcasts that way. Uh, I look at it much more as like uh, I want to learn. And so let's have a conversation about a topic. And the reason why that's uh, important is because in the learning process of having a conversation, it's not me just extracting information out of you. Like I'm happy to, if they say something like complete, take it in a completely different direction and be like, Oh, well, what about this thing that mm -hmm. I've been an expert on? It's just like, tell me what you, what you think. So that leads to like what makes a good guest and a bad guest. Uh, there's two frameworks I would use. If a guest asks for anything to be edited out afterwards, not a good episode. Like 100% <laughs> guaranteed, that sucks. How, um, how often does it happen? All the people who are media trained, they always have either them or somebody else. Uh, and then two <laughs> is um, I would say that uh, I'll, I'll give you a good example. I don't want to say who it was, uh, but there's an episode I recorded. Uh, obviously, this person and I both knew that we were going to talk about some topics that, you know, were on the fringe. Uh, and I was like, look, man, you can afterwards listen to it. If you want me to edit anything out, like happy to do it. I don't want to, you know, no gotcha questions, all that type of stuff. And we recorded the whole thing. I sent it to him. He responds to me literally with, uh, man, it got a little hairy when we talked about X. <laughs> But fuck it. If they come for me, they come for me. <laughs> right. so like, that is a good guest. Yeah. That is somebody who is willing to speak their mind, tell how the much, truth, like whatever, right? How much of that editing request is because they just want to come, ac come across as if, you know, they're like, you know, media trained or they want to have this perfect story, that kind of thing. Like, I, I, find, I find that sometimes even if they're okay with it, they just want to like tell you, oh, edits over mm -hmm. here or there kind of thing like, yeah, so sometimes people thinking? just want to like tell you edits because you gave them the option to give to give yes, edits so exactly. they feel like, like that's like they did their homework yeah. uh plano one time said to me uh something to the effect of like the people who want to like correct the record right or mm -hmm. like are like really worried about something uh nobody cares what they say Right. Like, like nobody cares about, uh, uh, that. And so like, obviously they're coming on the podcast. Like I find them interesting in, in some way. I think when Plain interviews people, same thing. Um, but the other thing I would say is like, what makes the best guest? It's the guest who can come in and like, we can sit down and we can literally talk about anything. Yeah. Like you could be like, Hey, uh, the color of the carpet is black. Like, Hey, you know, one time I went to this place and like, I saw how carpet was made and, and like, next thing you know, you've been talking for three and a half hours and you're like, how did we talk about like carpet and then this conspiracy theory and then like this thing? And, and you're just like, oh, you're just like a cool person. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and part of the problem is that uh, those people are hard to identify sometimes because you see someone who's good at writing as an example, or you see someone yeah. who's good at something else. Yeah. And then they get in front of the microphone. And, and they, this they just right translate. There. Yeah. Before the interview, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the interview starts and like, and then yes, like yes, okay, yes. Yeah. And they like get real Ooh. quiet and they kind of like, and you're like, no, like who's the where what just happened? Like, <laughs> what happened to that person? You know, I think one of my theories, by the way, this is really tied to kind of PR comms and you know, sometimes good reason. Like, for example, when I was in all these big tech companies, I was so trained to be on message, you know, yes. have the smallest possible surface area where you could get into. Uh, trouble. trouble because it's sort of a random Facebook product manager. The upside of creating press was the downside of saying something wrong or an inadvertent scoop to one of you know Polina's ex colleagues would be bad, right? And it took me a <laughs> long time and maybe a long way to go before I get as interesting as either of you. Before I feel like I can be myself, get my personality and artist personality out there, and I don't have to be you know well the way we think about it at company X is we are trying mm -hmm. to serve humanity and blah blah blah. And you know, it took me a long time to train myself out of that. And also, you realize that people don't like that. Like that whole sh spiel is just so boring. Even you yes. know, even on the other side, it's like people who are like writing down these interviews are like, okay, that's snoozy. Yeah. Like, 
That would be I something that's real. Word salad. Tell them about the sports. Salad. Exactly. Tell them about the sports athletes. Oh my god! So <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college, like I, um, everybody had a beat right at the newspaper. Mine was always like the administration and covering like the finances. I would sit in on meetings. It it was interesting to learn like basically the store follow the money uh, is what I took away from that. But there was then the crime beat and then the sports beat. And I used to say, like, I feel like sports writers have the hardest job because I went to the University of Georgia where there's a ton of athletes. And then the quotes are just so, I mean, they're they're the same. You you ask them, wow. like, so what happened with, at, with the game? You're never going to get something super unique. It's like, you know, we came together as a team. <laughs> we really got after it. And then a few, like, cliches in there about, like, yeah. we are one. And then that's it. We'll work so hard and we'll be back next week. I'm going to get to the really fun, spicy uh, topic now. So, and this is something very relevant to us. So mm. you folks are unique because I think, you know, the four of us might be, you know, some of the couples doing content often together. Right. And I don't think there's too many of us in sort of the, you know, the little YouTube Twitter verse that we inhabit. So how is it? to work together on air, you know, as content creators, outside of just being, you know, married, no being parent, congratulations, and yeah, all yeah. of that, right? Um, and I think we have our own takes too, but I want to kind of hear from both of you. All right, can I start? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, <laughs> only, no, we me. only care about um, what you have to say. Like, Tom is just like... I'm an expert husband. I wasn't going to speak first and potentially <laughs> lay down a trap for myself. No, one time, one time I was like, isn't it crazy how I, it's only that I get mad at you and you never get mad at me. It's clearly because I'm an angel and I do no wrong. He's like, that's not at all what that means. <laughs> um, but we, when we first started doing content, uh, in the form of the Lunch Money Show in 2020. Um, it was really interesting because if you look at those first episodes, I was exactly what he described earlier. Like, you know, you have your personality, but then you get in front of the camera and I was just like very stiff. I didn't really talk. I, mm -hmm. I was nervous and I, I was scared of saying the wrong thing because I think I'm a way better writer than I am on camera. So then um, it was really interesting because now I look back at those early days. And I'd be like, oh, look, this is the video where I got mad at you for this thing right before. And this is the time where I, and yeah. it's just like, I have a really hard time putting my like <laughs> emotions to the side and then being like, hello, you know, and, and putting on a face. Um, but over, over time, I think we've like learned how to work together much, much, much better. And it all stems from like communication and being like, you know, I don't think you meant to do this thing, but it annoyed me. So therefore... Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Just... Pompliano, how do you respond? <laughs> I, I think that's all accurate. The The biggest thing around content today is like, uh, to some degree, Polina was really good at doing her job because she knew how to play the game of journalism inside the institution, like all that type of stuff. Uh, and probably the reason why I was able to build an audience on the internet is because like I knew how to play that game. Right. And they're like two completely different games. Yeah. Um, but I would caution people that like, I learned a lot from Polina because I saw like, well, how did they do it? Like they've been doing it for decades, right? And so like, what can you learn and take away? And like, sure, you know, it's no secret. Like I think a lot of it's nonsense, right? And I think that those people are, uh, um, if they were good at their jobs, they would go do it on the internet themselves, but they can't. So they need the brand to like protect them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen it. The best tend to leave and go and build these great, you know, bodies and they were amazing journalists before and they're still amazing journalists today. And now they just do it for themselves, uh, which begs the question, like if you haven't left yet, why? And it could just be, hey, you like the security of a job. Great. That, that's a perfectly fine answer. But for most people, it's because they couldn't survive on the Internet without the brand. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean, though, that we can't learn from how do they do things like everything from like, how do they do the production process of content right. to how do they think about, you know, interviewing, what are the stories they find interesting or not interesting and, and all that type of stuff. So I think that's like one big piece of it. The flip side of that is on the internet, like it is war, right? right. And people, I, I think there's a lot of people who they don't want to wake up every day and go to war. And so what you find is uh, when you start out, it's all rosy. But like, what do you do the first time that someone's like, you're dumb? Right? I cried. 
it really gets you. I mean, when we you know when yeah. we get you know negative comments, right? And it could be on everything. You know, it's better if it's on your content. Sometimes it could be on your appearance or something totally random. And it it yeah. it does get to you. Um, you know, and I I think a lot of people have thick skins, but we haven't really figured out how to do that yet. I don't know. I kind of have this like Michael Jordan thing. It just motivates me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I yes. love the I love the. I'm like keep it coming. Like you know, this is the thing that's going to let, let me wake up tomorrow and do better. I, I would stop her from chasing down YouTube commenters. So don't leave mean comments on this episode. Trust me, Arty is googling you and you finding, finding finding where <laughs> you live. So but like, if you think about like, so like comments is is like a piece of it. I would almost break it into a couple of buckets, right? There's like obviously like mean comments, which I don't think anyone wants to read, but like that's part of the internet, and you got to decide: are you going to be a comment reader? or you're not right mm -hmm. and like there's pros and cons to both but but that's like one piece of it then there's like what i consider like uh, uh the passive aggressiveness where yeah. like the like reply guys come in oh and yeah everyone has that one person that always replies to their tweet and you're just like you're a loser right but like whatever you're gonna keep responding to the tweet like knock yourself out <laughs> then there's like direct confrontation Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look at it, like most people will deal with the comments because they kind of have to, mm -hmm. right? And, and they'll just choose maybe the the absolute worst response is like, hey, I'm just not going to read it. Fine. Okay. Not a big deal. The passive aggressive, the mature people just like let it go. The immature people like me, right? Are like, no, like screw you. And they like respond back. <laughs> then it, when it comes to the direct confrontation, I always think of like, that's where the professionals are made because you, there's only two uh, responses you can have. You completely ignore forever. One of the fascinating things, LeBron James has never responded to Skip Bayless. Yep. In almost two wow. decades, Skip Bayless has tried to school him, has tried to defame him. I mean, like anything he possibly could, he has said to LeBron, and LeBron has never responded. It's a power move. Okay, okay like, so like, what's the what's the other kind? That's the one I want to know for professionals. If someone shows up with a flamethrower, you show up with one two times as big. <laughs> Yeah. That's the only two responses because anything <laughs> in the middle is basically you're like showing up to a gunfight with a water gun. So like yeah. you, you have to choose who you the, are. The problem, the problem though, is that like the internet is no place for logic and zero. And yeah. yeah. It's, it pulls you kind of to the extremes. Mm -hmm. You either have to have discipline to ignore it, which like, I think most people aspire to, but we're all human or let's go. It's war yeah. time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Who's <laughs> So two comments, you know, on the LeBron thing, I always think about that Mad Men scene where Draper is in the lift with the other guy and he says, you know, I feel sorry for you. And Draper says, I don't think of you at all. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, that's the go-to. But I would say among the two of us, uh, you know, I have to stop Arti so many times from going after somebody on Twitter. Wait, right? I'm like, just... what happened? Are you crazy? I mean, <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm in the Balaji school here. It's like, you bring a flamethrower, I'm fucking yeah. bringing like, you know, five I of those that. and just coming after you. So. And I'm going, I, I can't say that. And I, okay, go for it. But sometimes it gets upsetting. I, I, it's been a year. I used to show him like stuff that it would yeah. like respond and show him be like, you can't post that. And like, now I just don't like, so you were the answer in the end of relationship. <laughs> Helena once a week is like, no, just like you, like, come on. Like, like you say a lot of crazy phone. things on the internet, like that one, just put that one in the drafts, just leave it there. God, oh my God. Goodness. I, I, yeah, I, 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 it does get the well, art to just tweet stuff once when I'm like, I, uh, okay, fine, like, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, she's the spicy one. Okay, do you change any of your methods or tactics of how you talk to guests? Yeah, I'm human and I hate that I do it, but I caveat questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like ask yeah. stuff. I'm like, well, you know, I stand on this side, but like, what do you think? And it's like, this is so stupid that I have to reiterate that, like, I don't agree with X topic. Right. Right? right. And so I, I think that uh, the ramifications are really hard to identify in the short term. But over mm -hmm. a long period of time, there's like this self-censorship that starts to happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, like bad things are bad things. And I, I think that audiences are smart enough to recognize when uh, a host is asking a question and trying to understand something versus the host is like, I also agree with this bad thing that society already thinks is a bad thing. Right. Yeah. So, Polina, I want to ask you this because I don't know whether you know this about me, but I am obsessed with pro wrestling. Um, I've grown up as a fan. I'm obsessed with it. I go to all the resumes. I think Pomp might know this, but I'm obsessed with uh, pro wrestling. We and have how... a title yeah, belt here. A WWE title right here. <laughs> uh, Literally uh, pro wrestling. That's just one of his favorite things. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have a whole theory about how pro wrestling is basically the keys to life. But so when. Who does our... you... The video <laughs> editor, Matt, he told me that too. <laughs> no, which is why I love your profile of Dwayne Johnson. 
the yes. rock right you know probably you know he's on the mount rushmore of pro wrestlers and then you had an interaction with him so talk to us about what do you think give us a secret to the rock what do you think he does right because the story is fascinating yeah ooh i think the rock is the type of person he he says um he says find your uh, hole in the wall opportunity so he claims that growing up and then in his career he would see like a kernel of like a tiny thing and then he would just like go go full speed ahead and and like make it into a bigger hole basically um but but he he's just he's somebody who he he says like always keep your failures at the forefront of your mind because i think there's a there's a sense as we get more successful and people become you know more well respected that there's a sense of complacency that comes and it, to to stay on top of your game is really really difficult so i think that's his point of like keep the failures at the forefront of your mind because he's like i'm always in my mind i'm always this close from getting evicted i'm always this close of like going to jail and all the things that he went through as a kid he's like i'm i'm still there and i think that that's why he's enjoyed the success that he's had and how was it when he tweeted out to you that was crazy. So, okay, so the story was I this happened the day before Christmas and I was visiting family in Atlanta and I was on a walk with my dad and we were walking by this river. We were just chatting and like I took out my phone and I just saw like 81 text messages and tweets and, and emails and I was like, oh my god, dad, hold on one second. I think I got canceled. <laughs> what, yeah, wait, wait, what did Pomp say now? Has, has exactly. like, you know that feeling when you get really hot and like your stomach gets all crazy? I was like, oh no, it, something happened. And then I read and, and then it's like actually I saw your text and was like, oh my God, the rock. And I was like, what what happened? And then I saw that basically I published this dossier i do these deep dives into individual people and break down um kind of their successes and careers and stuff and um i had done one on him and then i had tagged him <laughs> when i published it and he happened not only to see it but to read it like it retweet it i think he tweeted about it four times then he put it on instagram and then he put it on facebook and then i ended up on national news in bulgaria <laughs> <laughs> Were your parents proud? Oh my God, my parents, grandparents, great grandparents, they were like, oh, you're on TV with The Rock. They're like, yeah. you're friends with The Rock. Yeah. Like, when do we meet them? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's, that, that, was that, awesome. was a, that was a fantastic profile. Interview. I can see why Interview. he liked it. And by the way, I would say, you know, when I was kind of preparing for this, one of my favorite episodes uh, of the Palm Show, Palm has many, many favorite, great episodes, is the one that where both of you together break down various people like Chris Jenner, yes. Keanu Reeves, right? You know, we should drop a link in the comments. It's, yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, I, okay. did, I did no work for that one, by the way. Planner brought all the information. I just asked questions. It was amazing. That was one of my favorite oh. episodes as well. Oh, my God. <laughs> my favorite moments is the one that's like, where Pomp is trying to, like, correct Paulina, and I can see the brain in Pomp's head go, like, should I push this issue? Okay, maybe I'll just kind of back off, right? Like, <laughs> you should uh, never. You should never. <laughs> yeah, every, every husband out there will know like if you hear two plus two equals five you're like yep that sounds good to me <laughs> uh, we have so much in common with you know, especially that two plus two is equal to five Karam would literally say that because he's not great at math <laughs> <laughs> I feel like me and Sri Ram are like a kindred spirits oh, in yeah. you guys. <laughs> like we literally walked around at a dinner we hosted recently to showing our like our second kid, our son. Being like, he is eight months old. I'm like, no, he's not. He's seven. Oh. And she, and Sri Ram's like, what? And he's, <laughs> he's literally counting with his fingers, and he's like. Oh yeah, he's seven months old. It's all the same. It's all the same. Okay, this, I was going to ask you this, folks. So you folks are new parents, right? First of all, congratulations. Um, and how much has that a changed both of you? It's kind of like a deeper conversation, but also maybe changed the way you think about your content, storytelling, and approach to all things. Yeah, we we changed it dramatically. I think in the beginning, I was like, oh, it's okay. Like if every once in a while, if we like post the picture of Sophia or something like that. And then, and then I completely changed my view. And now there will be no tweeting, Instagramming or videoing. <laughs> why? Oh, why? I, 
So, um, no, I'll just say it. <laughs> a guy who I think had very nice intentions he came up to us in a coffee shop and he was like, Oh, and he knew the kid's name and was like, and I was like, we're done. We're, <laughs> we're, we're done with yeah. this. This is, uh, uh, I think this is getting weird and uh, you got to creepy. Yeah. I, I think one of the, it, I think one of the pieces that uh, there's an entire cohort of people who have been creating content on the internet, let's call it like 2015, 2016 to today. So like in the last 10 years, which is uh, a different period of time than like maybe like beginning of Facebook to like, you know, 2015, right. That, that period of time was like the audience sizes were smaller. There were different types of content. It was much more niche. Like there wasn't as much monetization, like all stuff, but like this new generation of people, if you call it, uh, they're all going through the same arc. It's mm -hmm. like, it started dopamine hit. This is awesome. Build a big audience, mm -hmm. get the big audience. Oh shit. I'm on a hamster wheel. Oh shit. Everyone knows everything about my life. Oh shit. Like they expect to know even more about my life. And people come up to you and they're like asking you questions. You're like, that's none of your fucking business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> like just to be like blunt, blunt, but like you also, you want to be like, it's not their fault. Right. Like they're, they're, yeah. they're, uh, uh, they're they have this parasocial relationship with you. 100%. Right. And, and so I think that, uh, eventually you just got to like ask yourself, like, what, like, what do you, who do you want to be? What, what, what is the path that you want to take? Um, and if you go back, like actually a lot of the people who were in that first generation of like people creating content on the internet, like, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss has a very, I think, articulate, uh, post about like, I don't want to be famous. It's mm -hmm. like, well, like, Hey Tim, like <laughs> a little late for that. Right. But the way that he writes it is not from like a, I regret as yeah. much as just like, here's the things I learned. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's like a whole nother generation of people who are kind of going through this. And it goes back to like, do you want to be like uh, famous and like not nearly as wealthy as everyone thinks you are? Or do you basically want to be successful and like known in the circles that you really care about? Like, do you mm -hmm. want people's respect or do you want like fame? Mm -hmm. And uh, as many people for decades and decades and decades before, you know, in, in various industries have learned, like chasing the fame is somewhat of a little bit of like a, you know, grasping at sand. And so I, I think that, uh, you got to find the balance, like what works for you, right? There's no one yeah. single, you know, uh, formula, but, but I think that's kind of where we ended up. Mm -hmm. So kid stuff is off limits. What else changed for you with respect to like, what's off topic when you're on air as such? Or change the way you do content, right? Like how you mm -hmm. approach content itself. I think now it's much more like to get started, it goes back to, uh, the comment that, uh, I, I told both of you of just like, you got to do it every day. Like yeah. there's this element of like, you just have to use, quantity and like momentum and velocity mm -hmm. to build an audience on the internet. It's really hard to break through. Uh, and it's near impossible unless you have some, you know, uh, advantage preexisting, uh, to just say, like, hey, I'm going to produce one thing a week. And like, it's going to be a home run. Like, mm -hmm. It's just really hard to do that. And so usually mm -hmm. the velocity ends up helping. Uh, but then once you get the audience, like you don't have to do it every day, like focus on the quality. So you have to kind of understand it's, it's very similar to a, a business. Like first you have to build a product and you have to find product market fit and you actually have to scale and, and kind of build the business around it and, yep. and understanding where you but, are in that journey is important. Yeah. But what about having a child change that? Oh, I think the child is, you know, there's some people who operate their lives uh, trying to get away from their kids or their wives, right? Like I, I've been to dinner and literally people are like, you know, they, they like say it. They're like, yeah, I'm here. You know, I got out of the house. Yeah. And you're like, dude, that like your life sucks, man. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, he, come on. Uh, and so, you know, you guys know, like you have young kids, like yeah. at some point, if, if you actually enjoy it again, maybe you don't enjoy it, but if you actually enjoy it, like you're like, I don't want to do this other stuff. I want to spend time with, yeah. you know, my family. So yeah, I uh, once had a former coworker who called me at like 6 PM and he's like, that's my kid's dinner time, but I just want to like give you a call on this. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Why don't we just chat in a couple of hours? And he's like, no, no, I really just <laughs> didn't want to be there. And yeah. I was yeah. like, okay, wow. <laughs> that's uh, good. So, so, let, let me actually just, <laughs> Please you know, don't hang up. <laughs> uh, uh, let me actually, maybe, you know, I have this theory on kids. Actually, I haven't even told Artie this, so, uh, which I was thinking about. So, you know, not even to uh, sad, but like my mom recently passed away and, you know, um, it was fine. She was, you know, and, but, you know, one of the things I realized was I didn't have a lot of content about her, right? Like, you know, not enough photos, mm -hmm. not enough videos, you know, it just kind of like the age before, uh, you know, the iPhone and whatnot. And one of the things I think about is, you know, for me, for all of us, like, you know, someday, unless YouTube deplatforms us for all the Andrew Tate conversations, right? You know, we, you know, our kids will 
and maybe, maybe they don't want to maybe they'll all hate us and they'll be like we don't want to see this anymore but they'll have like hours and hours of content of their parents looking mm. hot and young and good and you know <laughs> uh, it you know it uh, it's uh, all the youtube comments <laughs> <laughs> uh, youtube would have deleted them by now or we'll figure out some way to like you're not as good looking as you think sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first topic <laughs> uh, well delete right uh, 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 but you know i think you know i think there's something you know might be cool about your kids basically seeing their parents through their 30s through their 40s and hopefully you know we all get to do this for years and years and you know i think that that, that could be kind of cool yeah i i i've thought about that a lot actually and when i talked to jim o'shaughnessy he said that the best gift you can give your kids is writing them letters and whether it's a letter or a scrapbook or a video um i think it's kind of it, it serves as a time capsule for the kid and they're like whoa this is so cool like my dad recently visited and he brought these photo albums of like his well i guess mine too but uh grandparents and great grandparents so there's photos of like my grandfather when he was 19 years old and we found three different girlfriends who none of whom were my grandmother <laughs> uh, like it's so cool to see leave that man alone <laughs> it's cool to see like what they wrote on the back of the photo the photos were dated like 1929 or whatever it was interesting that they when they wrote dates they would drop the one so it was like 929 it was very confusing but um but it but it was like really cool i was like i'm holding something that's 100 years old uh and i think that that's going to be And and Jim Jim actually said what if we're actually living through one of the most interesting periods in history letters have a way of capturing that for your kids. Yeah. I I I think I've been trying to do that uh, not consistently but I've been trying to write uh you know I kind of send an email to myself but I try and write a note every month to you know first my daughter and like oh, now both cool. of her kids yeah. and it's just about like It, it's often i just like a paragraph of like what they did the last month or what we went through in the last month but i'm hoping over time you know it kind of like becomes a thing and it look maybe they just hate us and they'll be like you know our parents are the most boring people ever you know reason no. like you know maybe it's fun That's um amazing. okay so you know on, on maybe the profound topic you know it's going to get to the end of this uh let's say you're looking back 20 years from now or 30 years from now both of you right like what would what would make you happy right about the things that you're doing now you know obviously you, you folks have a fantastic young family and you know you're a lovely couple you're building amazing content universe you know uh the pomp and polina content universe <laughs> what would make you happy looking back 20 years from now what would you want to accomplish i know his answer do you want oh, wow. to go, go ahead you can say one <laughs> it's so funny because i think anthony gets asked this question a lot and i think people expect something like you know success or wealth or you like know bitcoin somewhere bitcoin or whatever <laughs> and his answer is always i just want to look back and like be like oh that was the happiest time of my life or like be happy and happy is such a vague like mushy term but i think the way that you define it is do you want to say yeah well, it's, it's just it's, okay <laughs> i mean it's literally just if you think of like being happy uh can you do the things that you want to do when you want to do them with the people you want to do them with freedom yeah. right like like to some degree that is what everyone wants to do and and you can look at it through the flip lens of uh when are people unhappy they can't do something they want to do they can't do it when they want to do it or they can't do it with who they want to do it and so if you can just have that freedom uh obviously yes money is a piece of that but also like there's like this weird like psychology component to it there's also like uh some of the most important decisions you have you make or like who you marry where you live you know all, all these things that i think who you have kids with yeah generally well, hopefully that's the person you married well, uh hopefully those things have uh, uh kind of permeated into uh you know kind of the the conversation if you will mm-hmm. uh but i think that that is a great reminder of just like are you happy today? And if you're happy today and you can go to sleep and be like, man, today was fun or like today I had a good day and then mm-hmm. do it again and again and again, it goes back to like the content creation stuff of just like the little things add up to the big things and uh, you know, amazing. And I'll say one more thing. Can I say? Okay. You say uh, your show. I, I don't know why oh, I keep I asking you. I should be asking. I, I, I know, Polina, this is your show. Like I'm no. telling you, he's just garnish here. Yeah, we let it go my part. <laughs> yeah, get a microphone. I think I'm J Lo. No, um, so, so the, the one thing that I was thinking. So my birthday's on Wednesday, and today I wrote this thing about like some of the lessons or things that I've thought about over the last year um, that I've learned. And one of them is, I think, especially for parents with 
like for first time parents with newborns or babies, I think a lot of times it's like, you kind of, you kind of feel like, oh my God, I didn't get enough sleep. There's toys all over the floor. Like it's just all the stuff all the time. And then I always remind myself that in 20 years when I'm getting like nine, 10 hours of sleep, but the house is quiet, even though everything's organized and it's in its place and everything, like you're going to refer to this messiness right now as like the good old days. Oh yeah. yeah. And I think about that a lot. So that just kind of like, it brings me back to, okay, enjoy this now because it's temporary. What I took out of that is her birthday's on Wednesday and I'm going to have to get a gift now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Maybe. No. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> I can't think of a better. It's such a great note to end. And I want to say, even with like two kids for us, that hasn't changed. You know, the second kid, we thought, oh, you know, we've seen this movie before, but no, yeah. it's amazing. It's really yeah. nice. It's Wait, the best I want to ask you, can I ask you guys a question? Go yeah, for it. Go for sure. it. What, is, what is the biggest lesson you've learned about like marriage and parenting, given that you've done both? Well, biggest lesson. Wow, that is so profound and deep. Sharam, you go first. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, okay. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, okay. Let, let me maybe. I or something okay. unexpected that you've learned. Okay. Let me, okay. Let me give maybe give maybe more the profound and a trivial answer. I think a lot of, for, I think the key to a relationship is a lot, most life is just the mundane. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you wake up, you kind of like go through your regular day, you know, you brush your teeth, you know, you do some email or whatever it is, whatever it is. And I think there is some, you have to find the person, the things which makes the mundane happy, right? It's not the date nights, it's not the vacations, it's not the big moments, and those are amazing. But just statistically, most life is the mundane. So if you, and I think, you know, oh, you have to find somebody that, uh, and I think when the author is going to use this, I'm going to steal this line, right? You have to be, you have to be happy, you know, just kind of sit on the couch next to each other and just do email, right? Like, or just do your thing or, you know, and because that's going to be a lot of time that you spend, uh, which is not going to be like super deep, meaningful conversation. And I think it's important to find somebody that you can just be bored and be mundane with. And, you know, because that is going to be so much of life. Wow. Okay. Did I get that wow. right? <laughs> <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> we practiced, but not well enough, clearly. <laughs> I'm going to yell that later. No, I, I, I also think it's like, it's, it's, we met each other when, you know, we've known each other for more than half our lives now. Wow. And so we, we've now spent enough time knowing each other than not knowing each other, being alive. That's kind of crazy to think about. And so uh, we are the two people we've known each other the most through our adult life, which means like, you know, I think for us, um, it, it's, it's weird because when, with most of the couples, like we talk to them, we go to these dinners and all of that. And it's like, it's a different relationship. And, you know, yeah. we have these dinners, like what you'd said, where it's like, the, there are no questions. And it's very like, I'm like, oh my God, do they like get along yeah. with each other? Are they okay in their lives? And for us, like, there's like, we're bickering, we're fighting, we're yeah. happy, like everything, like there's this whole movie that plays out during this dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and we're seeing the whole thing play out and we wouldn't have it any other way right like this is kind of how it is for us and so i think um it, it's just fun like it's fun to like live this life with somebody and i think it's like a lot of people don't have that and i, I just think we're like grateful Aww. to have that I love, I love this yeah. you guys need to you need to come to miami so we can gonna move okay gonna move. <laughs> we, we you, guys, you guys heard it here first uh both of them move into miami oh, oh yeah. <laughs> you know what we should do like we should kind of do an offshoot of a channel just kind of like relationships and couples advice i think you know it'll be a total banger okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, i just want to say you folks are both so lovely so accomplished you know congratulations on yeah. all the success on the amazing family um and you know you know and just fi finding happiness being curious just continuing to learn just trying to keep up with you guys <laughs> i don't know uh, well, oh well, and, you, know, you guys folks are amazing so you, uh, you know pat fundamental on and palm go and buy a birthday gift for paulina you need to get on that uh, i already have an idea as to what i might get her all right, nice. That's awesome. all right. Well, this was a blast thank you so <laughs> so you much and we should do this again in person in miami you yes. got it thank you guys <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you for watching another episode of The Good Time Show. Please do subscribe to us here on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, anywhere at all. And we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. What? Who sponsors? <laughs> um, okay. Well, just, just... We don't have any sponsors, but please subscribe. Subscribe. Hit the bell. Mm -hmm. All Just like all the things. You know what to do.